China's modernization, its massive economy, driving global trade, a huge domestic market and major exporter, innovative, investing at home and abroad, building international infrastructure, expanding its Belt and Road Initiative, sharing its technology, promoting Chinese global initiatives and advancing common prosperity, all part of China moving forward. I'm Arnand Naidu and welcome to a CCTV United Nations special program focusing on China's modernization and its global impact on common prosperity. Over the last several years, China's economic growth and innovation have transformed the country and that success has had a positive effect around the world, particularly in developing countries. China's Foreign Minister Qin Gong underlined Beijing's approach in his remarks at two sessions. He said, Chinese modernization is not pursued through war, colonization or plundering. It is dedicated to peace, development, cooperation and mutual benefit and is committed to harmony between humanity and nature. Later in the program, you will hear from a distinguished panel as we discuss some of these important themes. But we begin with Mozambique's foreign minister, Veronica Macamo, whose country holds the UN Security Council presidency for March. She spoke with my CGTN colleague, Ju Deji, and began by addressing Chinese President Xi Jinping's vision of building a community with a shared future for humanity. Xi Jinping's thought is an extraordinary one. It brought to the world a very important element, that we are all human beings. We must take actions so that our world will become a better one. It brought up the idea that it is important that there is a concerted effort for us to move forward. I believe that the world should look at this policy as important for the society of nations. The United Nations and the Security Council also actually look at President Xi's thought as one that can lead us into the future. We need, as I was saying, to develop our countries, but if we are not aware of the importance of peace, we will not move forward. He, for example, advocates dialogue, and dialogue is a very important element not only in the consideration of actions, both to get out of the Cold War and to get out of confrontation. We need to remove from our midst ideas that we know are harmful. It also argues that the relationship between countries must not only be based on mutual respect, but also on competition. So our world is more open, even in economic and political terms. And there is the spirit that we're humans and take care of ourselves, where each country plays its part. The Chinese government now set its economic development goal at 5% this year. Do you still think China is the driving force of the world economy? And how would China's economic growth benefit Mozambique and Africa? Speaking of Africa, I think we've been in need of a great deal of support from our Chinese friends. In Mozambique, we started with cooperation. Now we're moving into a partnership, a strategic partnership. So this means that relations with other countries, not only Mozambique, have evolved positively. I believe one of the things China has been gaining and will continue to gain is respect. In Mozambique, one of the biggest bridges we have was financed by China. Also in terms of production, there is a rice that's very good that all Mozambicans like. It's called Wambao. It's become very successful in our country. And it's interesting that a Chinese company is helping the people produce it. And that company guarantees the market. If people want to sell the rice to that company, they can do so. But if they don't want to, they can sell it to whomever they want. So it's a win-win relationship. It's a relationship that we effectively feel is not only about mutual respect, but also about a willingness to cooperate so that there are, as I said, mutual gains. 
China has also helped us when we have problems. So there are many advantages to this relationship. During COVID, we received a lot of support from China. They said, you want vaccines? You want masks? You want other materials to cope with these issues? We have counted on China, not just on issues of economic cooperation, but also for solidarity. And when you have a friend who supports you during your time of distress, he is not only your friend, he also becomes your brother. What, what would be your expectation for China-Mozambique relationship in the future? I can only expect that this relationship will get better. It started before the independence of Mozambique. China supported Mozambique in the struggle for its liberation. Then we signed an economic and technical cooperation agreement that lasted until 2016. In 2016, we moved up a notch and had China as a strategic partner. Therefore, I can only imagine that this relationship will continue to evolve. But even if relations are excellent, it is always possible to improve them. We believe they will continue to improve. Thank you. We also heard from Pakistan's Foreign Minister Bilawal Bhutto Zadari, who said his country will attend the upcoming Belt and Road Summit, and he was positive about the China-Pakistan relationship. Of course we will. Uh, Pakistan has the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which has made immense uh, progress over time, and I look forward to uh, being able to participate in uh, such a summit and share uh, with the world uh, what we've achieved uh, so far and what we plan to achieve together going forward. So what's your expectation with the, the cooperation with China? I, uh, my expectation is that it'll go from strength to strength as it has done throughout our history. Hungary is building a strong economic relationship with China, including the Belt and Road Initiative. Its foreign minister, Peter Sajato, talked to us about that. Well, when China comes up with such kind of initiatives, you always have to take those seriously into consideration because just remember the Belt and Road Initiative. When uh, it has been established or launched, uh, it has not been taken seriously into consideration by the global public, let's put it this way. And now, this is one of the major, <coughs> major uh, global and multilateral initiatives which uh, bring uh, progress uh, to those uh, who are uh, working together in this framework. So uh, we are excited to uh, take part on the summit of the Belt and Road Initiative sometimes in autumn in uh, China. We are encouraged to uh, do more in this regard. We are building the new um, uh, railway line between Belgrade, Serbia and Budapest, Hungary in the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. I am personally proud that I was the first European uh, foreign minister to sign an implementation agreement of this initiative back in the summer 2015 with that time Foreign Minister Wang Yi. So, um, so putting these experiences into consideration, uh, I think uh, the role of uh, China in multilateralism is absolutely positive. And uh, especially now, when there are such kind of uh, complications in the uh, security uh, environment, these kind of stabilizatory roles and these kind of uh, initiatives to promote uh, multilateralism, which means promoting dialogue, those are very important. We know that China has changed its COVID-19 policy in l late 2022. Uh, after that, we saw many world organizations has changed their projection of China's GDP growth this year and next year. Um, what do you think of the economy of China and how would China's economic uh, benefit Hungary? Well, I can only uh, rely on our own experience. Uh, as we, um, back in 2020 as we, and 21, as we have not waited uh, for the European Commission to deliver finally the vaccines with a long delay. We rather bought Sputnik from Russia and Sinopharm vaccines from China. We were the quickest ones in Europe with the vaccination campaign. We were the first ones to be able to reopen economy and that gave us a huge boost in economic development. 2021 uh, brought record uh, uh, economic growth. So that's why uh, I do believe that based on our own experience, if you reopen, it means that you give a boost to your uh, economy. And why we cross fingers for the success of the <coughs> Chinese economy is that um, 
that they are booming Chinese investments in Hungary. And in our economy, uh, foreign direct investments play a huge role. And, um, and, and the Chinese companies are <coughs> heavily investing, especially on the field of uh, electromobility, which is going to be the key industry of uh, Europe uh, in the future. So we cross fingers for the success of the, uh, of the Chinese economy, because um, the quicker the Chinese economy grows, the more investments uh, Chinese companies make in Hungary. And the more investments they make in Hungary, the bigger economic growth we have. So uh, the economic successes of the two countries are somewhat um, uh, combined with each other. Time now to hear from our distinguished international panel. We are joined from Cape Town, South Africa, by Ibrahim Rasul. He is the former South African ambassador to the United States. From Boston, we are joined by Ambassador Jorge Heine. He is the former Chilean ambassador to China. And from Chengdu in China, we are joined by Henry Wong. He is the president of the Center for China and Globalization. Thanks to all of you for joining us. Ambassador Russell, let me start with you, and let's start with China's economy. My colleague, Zhu Deji, recently talked with the UN's Chief of Global Economic Monitoring. His outlook for China is very positive. Let's listen. Given that uh, the rebound of the, of the uh, consumer demand has been very strong in January, uh, of course, we have to uh, look at the seasonal effect. This is the in a Lunar New Year. Uh, so obviously, there's a lot of spending, a lot of pent up demand uh, from the households because uh, people could not spend uh, their money uh, or travel. So uh, obviously, there was a, a very quick resurgence in spending. And as you know, that household spending is the main driver of economic growth, GDP growth. Whether that would continue throughout the year, uh, and that is the question, because whether there will be other shocks, whether it's pandemic-related shocks and uh, recurring lockdowns or other uh, global shocks, especially uh, uh, worse than expected slowdown in Europe and, uh, and in the United States, that may affect China's net export situation. So overall, we are optimistic that this is the uh, positive trajectory for the Chinese economy, probably the worst is behind not ahead, unlike for other economies where we see the worst uh, could be ahead of them. But Chinese economy has turned the corner, and we believe, um, you know, this is again uh, what we mentioned, um, you know, in, in several our, our um, briefing to the media that this is our baseline scenario. Um, it could be significantly higher, uh, in fact, 5.2, 5.3. For the past a decade, I think we can say that the China has always been the the locomotive of the world economy, a driving force. Do you think this is still the, 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 the situation? Yes, I think so, because China's uh, growth is uh, quite critical for the rest of the world economy, uh, first of all, through multiple channels, because if you're a commodity exporter, uh, uh, most, most of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, they would want China to recover. That would mean that they would be able to sell their commodities and there'll be strong demand from China. Uh, same with, with the countries in the neighborhood, um, um, uh, Southeast Asian economies, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and they depend heavily on Chinese tourism. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that China is the number one source of global tourism right now. Um, I think numbers are about over 250 billion the Chinese tourists spend globally uh, in 2019. So that's a very large number, and many of the economies would like the Chinese tourists to return to their countries. So that would be another uh, driver of economic growth for the global economy. And the third, of course, you know, China is also a very important trading partner for, for Japan and Korea and other economies uh, that are, uh, including Germany and some other European countries, that export heavily uh, to China, uh, more high-end machinery and equipment, uh, and that helps their export. Uh, so it's a win-win situation for the global economy. So if China grows, and you are absolutely right, China over the last, since the global financial crisis, it has been a major driver of global growth, accounting for about a quarter of global growth um, uh, the, during the last decade. So Ambassador Rasu, as we hear there, a very positive message for Chinese growth. And the message coming out of the two sessions in Beijing is one of economic growth. The country has set a target of 5%. That could be a modest target for 2023. We shall see. Uh, but how critical will China's growth be for the countries of Africa as they look to emerge from the COVID pandemic as well as grow their own economies? Yeah, no, thanks. I think that the evidence of our experience in Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, 
bears out the idea that China is indeed poised for a major recovery and a surge um, following a number of setbacks, particularly COVID-19. And the way we feel it in Africa is that, for example, over the last two years, even from within COVID, we have seen um, China investing heavily in the infrastructure of Africa, getting back to building and fixing ports, um, roads, and, um, and, and railways and other infrastructure. We have seen trade just in 2019 alone worth $200 billion um, dollars between China and Africa. And so what I'm saying is that that's the evidence that we have, that China is not in deep trouble. It faced its challenges, but it came out, and it not only came out, it came out pulling Africa um, back up. And in South Africa, for example, our growth spurt um, following COVID-19 has largely come because we were able to sell commodities um, again um, to China. And that's helped the South African economy recover, even if modestly. So I would want to concur with that and really see China as a major engine of African recovery. Right. I want to get to China's uh, infrastructure development projects around the world in more detail in just a moment. But Ambassador Jorge Heine, China's economic development and modernization are also having a big impact in Latin America. And of course, there are mutual benefits when we look at the relationship there. How significant is this for all of Latin America as it looks to its future development? It is extremely significant. To give you only an example, right now for South America, as a whole, the number one uh, trading partner is China. It is not the United States, it is not Europe. Their trade reached $451 billion in 2021. It uh, increased by something like 7% in 2022. Uh, so uh, it goes without saying that China has become a, a major trading partner uh, for Latin America, and also increasingly in terms of investment. Um, there have been years in which uh, Chinese investment has been extremely significant for Peru, for Brazil, for Argentina, also for Chile, in which it had been lagging. Henry, you know, during that interview with the uh, chief of global economic monitoring at the United Nations, um, the economist there also addressed the impact that China's tourists are having on the global economy. Uh, it was massive before COVID, and many of these countries around the world are now eager to see the Chinese tourists return, as we heard. Chinese tourists spend something like $250 billion uh, in these countries. I mean, is this another example of how a rapidly modernizing and prosperous China is impacting economies across the globe? Uh, absolutely. Yes. I think that, uh, you know, uh, tourism actually accounts about 10% of global GDP in normal uh, circumstances. and. Uh, China is the fastest uh, going uh, tourism market, and uh, not only for the inbound, but outbound as well. I mean, uh, before the pandemic, uh, China has 150 million outbound tourists. And, and as, I, as you said, you know, spent the 250 billion uh, US dollars uh, around the world. And I think, you know, that's actually started. I, I was just coming back of, uh, uh, you know, tonight from the uh, uh, the Spanish and uh, and the China and uh, 50 years uh, established diplomatic ties as uh, you know reception. Uh, China Foreign Minister Vice Foreign Minister Dan Li said that uh, they are resuming uh, you know the fl flights and also uh, uh, tourism to uh, to Spain and uh, just to Spain for example before pandemic is uh, one million people uh, you know goes to Spain and 30 percent return tourists just just as one country. Of course there will be more going to uh, now to uh, North America and to Australia now is already all the students are back and uh, and also let alone uh, the, you know just, just uh, a tourist there's also uh, almost half a million and seven hundred thousand uh, Chinese student uh, uh, study around the world every year. Ambassador Rasul, we recently spoke with uh, Oliver Hillel, he from the United Nations Environment Program. He discussed. China's economic impact and China's engagement around the world. Let's listen to him. China's economy standard will very much define the planet's future. This is very clear to me. It is not only the, the, the largest country and the largest population, but it is also the country that has the longest 
civilizational history. It has more than 5,000 years of history. It has the accumulated knowledge of that. So I think um, in my experience in the Convention on Biological Diversity has shown that China's leadership is of essential importance to the entire world. And it is how China is changing its economy that will allow the rest of the world to learn with that as well. I think also what we, we see very much in China is a new history of non-colonialism. China uh, has been uh, cooperating with the world without the imposition of culture or values, as against much of what happened over the last centuries in, in history. So the experience of China establishing South-South cooperation models, which I have the privilege of participating, for instance, in 2015, UNEP did a, a South-South Expo in Nairobi, Kenya, with a Chinese institution called CISETE, which is for South-South cooperation. It was amazing that um, the Chinese high-quality development vision is very pragmatic. It's trade-oriented. It's development-oriented. It's not uh, an imposition of a cultural model on the other. So Ambassador Rasul, Oliver Hillel makes the point there that China is not imposing its culture or its values um, on the rest of the world. I mean, how key is that for the countries of the global south, especially given the sordid history that they have had with colonialism when these things were imposed on them by mainly the countries of Western Europe? Look, I think that that's the threatening part to the West in terms of China's model of global relationships. It is the complete deployment of soft power, if I can use it like that. Um, it is soft power that is coming um, to a place like Africa. We are beginning to become a lot more familiar with Chinese culture, Chinese language, through a whole range of Confucius centers that are across um, Africa and learning about that deep history of civilization that is there in China. And so we're seeing the connectivity, the diplomatic ties, the exchanges, cultural exchanges that's taking place. And so the distance between China and Africa is becoming so small that we're beginning to know each other a lot more um, empathetically um, and intimately as we speak. But the most important part of the soft power is that through China's investments, we have seen a major impact. For example, let me just compare between 2016 and 2020. Investments for the, from the United States valuing 24 billion went into 401 projects across Sub-Saharan Africa. By contrast, um, 70 billion, 70 billion US dollars from China went into 346 projects. But let me show you the difference on impact. The US projects over that period created 54,000 jobs. The Chinese impact meant that it created 170,000 jobs across Africa. Now that soft power at its best, that is skilling Africans, that is employing Africans, that is making Africans empowered and self-sufficient as we build the infrastructure, roll out the rail, um, get the ports moving, and develop the trade relations. Ambassador Jorge Heiner, as the countries of Latin America uh, confront challenges like poverty, like inequality, can they draw inspiration from China's successes with things like poverty alleviation, building new cities, the advances that China has made in technology and innovation? Yes, absolutely. And here let me add a little uh, twist to your question on, on modernization. You know, 60 years ago, we had something called modernization theory, which postulated that developing countries would actually become rich, would become wealthy, if only they followed uh, the Western model of development, and that eventually they would succeed by doing that. Well, 60 years later, if we look at, say, uh, some of the most modern cities uh, in, in the world, which are those cities? 
they are, well, Shanghai, Singapore, Tokyo, Seoul, they are in Asia. And which is the most dynamic and fastest growing uh, region in the world? It is Asia. We're moving towards what some people have referred to as the Asian century, a post-Western world. And in that sense, it seems to me, the notion that uh, countries in the developing world must simply imitate Western development has become totally passé. Now we must look for uh, what is happening in, in Asia, which again, you know, is the most dynamic and fastest growing region in the world. Henry, uh, China, of course, is a very strong proponent of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and President Xi Jinping has introduced the Global Development Initiative. There's been something like 100 countries that have expressed support for that so far, and it addresses a wide range of issues, things like food security, as well as how... Uh, we're going to finance the digital economy. Um, how much of an impact will that have? Uh, China itself, you know, they have, uh, they have emphasized a lot on, on soil development. And uh, so they have learned and uh, actually gained a lot of experience. And now they want to uh, uh, contribute that and, and maybe, you know, uh, collaborate with all the developing countries. And particularly in collaboration with the United Nations SDG, uh, you know, 2030 agenda development. And uh, so that uh, China can share sure. their, uh, you know, expertise in uh, uh, infrastructure, in, uh, in uh, you know, agriculture, and uh, all the lift and poverty uh, process. I think, you know, whether, you know, uh, what that can be transferred, of course, depends on each country condition. But at least there's, there's some commonalities. You have to have a, a government planning, you have, you, but you really have to also mobilize the market resources. But also you have to really... Uh, consistently, uh, you know, one one five-year plan after another five-year plan, or at least also, uh, uh, you know, you get uh, education is, is one of the key success factors. Ambassador Rasul, I want to get back to something you mentioned a moment ago, and that is China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, it's now marking its 10th anniversary. Uh, almost 150 countries are members of this initiative. Hundreds of projects uh, are underway. What kind of an impact has this initiative had on the countries of Africa? Look, I think that I've illustrated it by numbers, but I think the quality of life in Africa has improved um, tremendously, not only in the number of jobs that we have seen, but in the quality of infrastructure, the connectivity across Africa. And without those connectivities of rail, road, ports, and air, um, it, would be, it would have been completely impossible for Africa even to think of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement in which 54 countries are now effectively in, a, in an FTA, in a free trade area um, with Africa. I think the idea of the African Development Bank being able to benefit um, of Chinese ways of restructuring our loans and the development aid that I think we have been receiving, I think is absolutely um, crucial. And then finally, I also think that um, the increasing trade has created a huge Chinese market for African goods. What we are going to need to do, and I think that South Africa as the chair of BRICS um, for the next while, we are going to have to ensure that we are also a market for certain Chinese goods that we are also going to improve the quality of trade between China and, um, and Africa, that we're going to improve the balance of trade between us and make sure that there's trade equity rather than a trade deficit. And so I think um, Africa is going to be challenged to improve the quality um, of its um, bilateral relationship with China. But the fact that we are being pulled out of the trough of COVID-19, a global recession, through um, Chinese consumption of our commodities, I think that that has been the barrier um, between collapse and, um, and, and, and stability on the continent of Africa. And that's all we have time for. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Thank you. It has been a great discussion. Thanks for joining us. And thank you for watching our special show on China's modernization and its global impact on common prosperity.